From above the clouds, an unusual campaign was launched, so bold that many called it the most unprecedented operation in U.S. history. It was expected to end the nightmare of two million invasive snakes and restore Guam to the bird paradise it once was. And, at first, it seemed to work. The snake population dropped quickly, and for a moment, it felt as if the island could finally breathe after decades of chaos. But as their slithering shadows faded, strange signs began to emerge. Numbers and field observations no longer lined up with early predictions. Nature, once again, was shifting in ways that left scientists stunned. So what happened to Guam after 10 years without snakes? Let's find out. One, background and the original threat. Guam, a small island in the middle of the Pacific, was once described as a heaven for birds. 12 species were found nowhere else on earth, from colorful honey eaters to the Mariana pigeon, filling the morning air with a natural symphony. That picture began to crack in the late 1940, when US military cargo ships arriving after World War II brought with them an uninvited passenger. It was the brown tree snake, Boiga irregularis, about five feet long, as flexible as a vine, with mottled skin that looked like tree bark. Not enormous, not armed with deadly venom, its very ordinariness made it easy to overlook as the first one slipped ashore hidden in wooden crates and supply containers. But on Guam, they had stepped into the perfect stage. No predators, no natural enemies, and plenty of food. Their life cycle became a breeding machine. A single female could lay more than a dozen eggs in one clutch and do so several times a year. Within just two years, the young reached maturity. From a handful of stowaways, the population exploded into millions within a few decades. What made the brown tree snake terrifying was not its venom, but the way it hunted. They climbed like masters, moving silently along branches, rooftops, and power poles. At night, they raided bird nests, swallowing both eggs and chicks. They slithered into chicken coops, killing a dozen birds in a single night, not to eat them all, but purely from instinct. Guam's residents lost hundreds of thousands of dollars each year as their poultry was wiped out. Even pets like small dogs and cats were not spared and were sometimes reported as snake attack victims. And then the snakes began invading people's daily lives. They appeared in kitchens, curled up near beds, even coiled inside baby cribs. While their bites rarely killed adults, the mild venom could trigger seizures and breathing problems in children, often sending them to the hospital. By the 1990, it was estimated that one in 10 households on Guam had encountered a snake inside their home. Their climbing ability also turned them into saboteurs of infrastructure. They often followed power lines and slipped into substations, and a single wrap of their bodies could trigger a short circuit. Some years, Guam recorded more than 80 power outages caused by snakes, costing tens of millions of dollars. Imagine, a single snake, barely five feet long, could shut down hospitals, schools, even key U.S. military bases. The impact on nature was even deeper. By the early 1980, at least 10 native bird species were extinct, and nine others had vanished from the forests. Without birds to spread seeds, many plants declined dramatically. Guam, once alive with birdsong, fell into an eerie silence, a true ecological graveyard. But that was only the surface of the disaster. By the late 20th century, an estimated 2 million brown tree snakes lived on the island. On average, every resident shared Guam with more than 10 snakes. In some forests, surveys found densities of up to 13,000 snakes per square mile, meaning you could hardly walk a few steps without encountering one. A small, seemingly harmless creature had managed to destroy an entire ecosystem, upend daily life, and bring the local economy to its knees. And as darkness, both literal and metaphorical, fell over Guam, one urgent question loomed. What could humans possibly do to stop an invader that seemed unstoppable? And that's when a so-called miracle idea appeared. Two, solutions and early hope. When the numbers on the maps and in field surveys became undeniable, birds gone, power substations failing again and again, daily life on the island thrown into chaos, people responded in the way they always do. Start with the simple solutions, and when those fail, think bigger. The next tactic sounded almost like a joke, yet people pinned their hopes on it. At first, the campaign relied on mechanical traps and trained dogs. Rangers deployed thousands of cage traps, plastic tubes, and net traps along forest routes, baited with food and experimental pheromone lures. Teams of detection dogs patrolled airports, ports, and residential areas to sniff out snakes hidden in luggage or cargo, while staff and specialists checked the traps daily. Images from the time cages being hauled up, snakes coiled inside, exhausted crews wiping sweat from their faces gave the impression of small victories, but the reality collapsed quickly. With densities of thousands of snakes per square mile, the traps captured only a tiny fraction, and the costs of labor, time, and maintenance soon grew beyond control. When conventional methods hit their limits, researchers turned to biology. 
Laboratory tests revealed that brown tree snakes were highly sensitive to acetaminophen, a common ingredient in household painkillers. In relatively low doses, acetaminophen disrupted liver and nervous system function in snakes, causing death within hours. That discovery led to a new idea. If the bait could be placed in the right spot, not on the ground, but high in the canopy where snakes hunt at night, it might be possible to eliminate large numbers of invaders without blanketing the entire island in traps. And so, the plan was announced, deliver bait from the air. In 2013, a field program began on a trial scale. The technical report described the process in detail. Mice were euthanized humanely, then dosed with a precise amount of acetaminophen attached to biodegradable materials or wax paper designed to snag on the forest canopy. Helicopters then flew grid pattern missions to drop the bait. Monitoring teams deployed trail cameras, established survey transects, and collected before and after data within the test zones to measure effectiveness. It was far more than simply dropping bait. It was a logistical chain, preparing thousands of mice, ensuring the correct dosage, obtaining environmental permits, planning flight paths to avoid residential areas, notifying the public, and organizing cleanup teams to minimize risks to non-target species. The initial results in the test plots were encouraging. In the months following the aerial drops, snake encounter rates along transects declined sharply, power outages decreased, and residents reported fewer nighttime sightings. The media called it a breakthrough. For the first time in decades, it seemed humans had found a way to tilt the balance. The cost of the program, though significant, was framed as a necessary investment to protect livelihoods and critical infrastructure. But even then, an ethical storm was brewing. Conservationists and some local communities questioned whether such mass extermination could ever be safe for the ecosystem. Would thousands of mouse carcasses attract flies, ants, and disease? Would scavenger species be harmed? Would this set a precedent for future biological campaigns? The government responded that all experiments underwent risk assessments, that dosages were calibrated to target snakes while minimizing harm to other species, and that according to early reports, the benefits far outweighed the risks. For a moment, hope flooded back a bold, high-tech strategy that could finally free the island from its snake nightmare. But nature does not wait for humans to decide who wins. As the ecological gap widened, something else began to emerge, something that would complicate the plan in ways no one expected. The snake population really did decline, but who truly won, who truly lost, and the real cost of that victory were only beginning to reveal themselves. 3. When everything went off course. When humans interfere deeply with natural systems, consequences often build quietly beneath the surface. Small changes grow, accumulate, and one day explode, sometimes at a cost far higher than eliminating millions of snakes. Follow the trail. At first, the reports read like a success story. Snake densities dropped in the test plots, power outages subsided, and a few reserves even heard bird calls again. People breathed easier. But that was only the surface. The deeper layers of the problem were already shifting. Within months of the campaign's end, local clinics and infrastructure teams began receiving unusual reports. Households were spotting rats in broad daylight, food stores were torn open, and kitchen doorways swarmed with flies. Some areas recorded heavier mosquito activity and standing water left behind after the rainy season. Community bulletins noted a slight rise in mosquito bite cases. And sanitation crews increased disinfection patrols around neighborhoods. Behind these observations lay a clear ecological chain reaction. When a major predator is removed, multiple links in the system are released at once. Not just a mesopredator surge in rodents, but also blooms in decomposers and disease vectors. Rodent populations climbed rapidly as predation pressure vanished. They raided grain, storage, crops, and any food source they could reach. The consequences included agricultural losses, depleted reserves, and rising repair costs. Flies and scavenger ants thrived immediately on the carcasses of poisoned bait and dead snakes. Their numbers multiplied, invading residential spaces and increasing the risk of food contamination. Cleanup teams could not keep up everywhere, leaving behind localized hotspots of decomposer activity. Mosquitoes reflected a more indirect but crucial mechanism. Decomposing carcasses and organic material enriched shallow water system. Combined with changes in vegetation, fewer pollinating birds, and less seed dispersal, altering plant growth, stagnant water persisted longer. That created ideal breeding grounds for mosquitoes. The result was a seasonal spike in mosquito populations and a growing risk of vector-borne diseases. Scavengers and insect-dependent species also shifted. Some surged initially thanks to the new food supply, but then crashed when that supply fluctuated, triggering unpredictable ripple effects. The consequences weren't just numbers in a report. They were smells in the air, rustling noises in pantries at night, early market closures due to contamination, evidence piled up quickly, tainted food, slight increases in digestive illnesses and fevers, farm workers reporting more bites, and infrastructure again under strain, not from snakes this time, but from rats gnawing cables, flies fouling equipment, and insects attracting predatory birds that temporarily changed their behavior. Timing mattered too. The disasters film did not unfold in a single day. 
Flies and ants surged within weeks, rodent populations rose dramatically within months, vegetation changes and their consequences took longer, leading to spikes in mosquitoes and disease vectors in later seasons. Each layer triggered new social and public health problems. Many of these effects were documented food stores damage, illness reports rising, residents complaining about rodents and flies. Other outcomes, such as nutrient feedback loops, driving mosquito booms, were scientifically plausible conclusions that required long-term data for full confirmation. And at the end of this chain lay a sobering paradox. A measure designed to eliminate one clear threat had created a complex new web of problems, where an army of new players, rats, flies, mosquitoes, ants wove a multi-dimensional disaster that ravaged crops and quietly attacked public health. Humanity had won a small battle, but now it faced a slow-burning war. Unless addressed comprehensively, that victory might only be a down payment on a far greater catastrophe. Who would be held responsible, and what solution could possibly be clever enough to fix what had been set in motion? Number four, the ecological and social domino effect. When the snakes vanished, the changes began in places almost no one noticed the soil, the leaves, the low shrubs. Birds, which for thousands of years had carried seeds across the landscape, were gone. Fruits fell where they grew, seedlings no longer traveled far, forest canopies that were once dense grew thin, more sunlight reached the ground, and places that had stayed dry now held water for longer periods. Small pools formed, organic matter collected in crevices, and the environment shifted quietly. But that new stability turned out to be a perfect home for other species. Flies and ants, those scavengers of flesh and waste, quickly took over. Animal carcasses, dead snakes, and organic debris left uncollected became a rich food source. Flies multiplied rapidly, swarming into markets and homes, contaminating food and water. Rodents, which had once stayed near the forest's edge, grew bolder. With few predators, they multiplied, climbing into grain stores, gnawing through rice sacks, invading kitchens, and stealing crops before they could be harvested. Their behavior changed. They appeared in broad daylight and grew far more active at night, a clear sign of a booming population. The consequences came quickly. The next harvest suffered heavy losses. Small vegetable plots that once fed families were stripped bare overnight. Food reserves the safety net for local communities were depleted as rodents chewed through supplies and flies spoiled packaging. Tourists heard the news and canceled trips. The tourism industry slowed. Local budgets, now burdened by the cost of repairing chewed power tables, fixing storage facilities, buying rodenticides, and expanding healthcare services, tightened. As public funds dwindled, schools and clinics were among the first to feel the impact. At the same time, public health showed subtle signs of distress. Clinics reported more cases of diarrhea, fevers, and infections linked to contaminated food and water. Sanitation programs increased disinfection rounds and carcass collection. Veterinary services ramped up livestock vaccinations to prevent further losses. Mosquitoes, thriving in the new water sources, surged during warm seasons, raising fears of vector-borne diseases. Problems that had once been small now piled up hunger, illness, and rising medical costs. People grew weary, their immune systems weakened, and communities lost both the financial and emotional strength to cope. These impacts didn't occur in isolation. They linked together and multiplied. A single night of power outage caused by a gnawed cable could spoil refrigerated food, wiping out a warehouse's entire stock. A lost warehouse forced people to buy from outside sources, draining savings and reducing nutrition. Their decomposers. Standing water was treated to limit mosquito breeding. The electrical grid, social consequences followed short-term job losses, higher living costs, and a decline in public confidence in the government's stopgap measures. Unlike a sudden accident, this was a cascading chain reaction. Ecological shifts led to food insecurity. Food insecurity triggered microeconomic crises. Economic strain weakened public health responses. Each layer added weight to the next, and together they transformed a single problem into a multidimensional crisis within just a few seasons. And as this spiral kept turning, one question echoed like a bell. Where do you even begin to fix it? Is there a way to break this domino chain before the island ends up paying a price far higher than the one it was trying to avoid? 5. The counterattack and the final gamble. Once everything had fallen apart, the question was no longer can we fix it, but how do we fix it the right way? On Guam, the counterattack was not a single campaign against snakes, but a layered set of actions, short-term efforts to protect people's daily lives, and long-term plans to rebuild the ecosystem. And every step came with trade-offs, risks, and a larger question. Who gets to decide? The immediate focus was on emergency measures to protect daily life. Food was stored in reinforced facilities, and packaging was secured to prevent rodents from getting inside. The surrounding environment was cleaned regularly to reduce flies and other decomposers. Standing water was treated to limit mosquito breeding. The electrical grid was strengthened with insulated cables and additional protection at substations. These actions might have seemed small and unremarkable, but they saved meals, kept lights on, and reduced immediate health risks. They bought precious time for longer-term solutions. At the same time, direct action against snakes continued, 
traps were improved, detection dogs were trained, and toxic bait was still used where permitted. This time, however, every operation included carcass collection, medical monitoring, and site inspections to prevent a feast for insects. Every eradication measure was paired with follow-up steps, insect surveys, food storage checks, and public health monitoring. Skipping these steps could turn a solution into a new problem overnight. On a larger scale, technology entered the discussion. Some research focused on sterilizing snake populations or developing vaccines for rodents. If successful, these approaches could control pests without mass killing. But they were expensive, time-consuming, and without clear precedence. Genetic engineering altering reproduction to suppress populations was also considered. But it raised difficult ethical questions. What if the changes spread to other species? Who would be held accountable if something went wrong? These were not just scientific issues. They were legal and societal ones too. A less controversial approach was to strengthen the ecosystem's natural immune system. Replanting native trees could restore seed dispersal cycles. Creating ecological corridors could help birds return and spread seeds. Breeding and reintroducing bird species that had disappeared from the forests could help reestablish balance. Rebuilding plant and small animal communities could restore the natural breaks that kept the system in check. These methods were slow and expensive. But, if successful, they would provide lasting stability rather than just another temporary trap. The role of the community could not be overlooked. No strategy would succeed without public participation and support. Farmers needed financial help after losing their harvests. Families needed guidance on food storage, rodent-proof containers, and waste management. Once people understood and participated, technical measures stopped being top-down mandates and became part of everyday life. But beneath every decision lay an ethical dilemma. Wiping out an entire species could save an ecosystem. But it also raised questions about the rights of those species and the limits of human intervention. Restoration efforts demanded patience and long-term policies, something not every government was willing to commit to. Every choice involved sacrifice. Perhaps the most realistic path forward was a combination. Implement proven emergency measures while gradually testing long-term solutions. Collect data continuously, analyze it, and adjust policies based on real-world results. In every case, transparency and accountability to the community had to be the foundation. In the end, this was not just a technical story, it was a story of power and responsibility, how far science can go, how deeply communities can participate, and who will stand accountable when things spiral beyond control. There has never been a single answer to that question. But if we do not answer it, every effort made today could become a burden for future generations. So what should take priority? Putting out the immediate fire or fixing the clock so it doesn't break again? And who will have the courage to make that choice? Six, lessons from Guang. Looking back, the story of Guam is not about a single species of snake, but about a series of decisions, each with consequences of its own. A seemingly insignificant invader silenced the birds, destabilized food security, shook infrastructure, and forced humans to pay enormous sums to repair the cracks they themselves had caused. And when they tried to fix it with a temporary solution, aerial bait drops, the island paid a new price. Rats, flies, mosquitoes, and disease surged. Daily life was disrupted, local budgets shrank, and public trust eroded. The paradox was undeniable. Intervention meant to save could create hidden debts, accumulating silently and erupting when least expected. Immediate victories could come at the cost of long-term risks. Three lessons cannot be ignored. Science must anticipate cascading consequences before recommending intervention. Policy must balance security, livelihoods, and ethics. And communities must be consulted, protected, and never treated as silent test subjects. The solution does not Standing lie water in a treated single dramatic dramatic mosquito but breeding. in a coordinated sequence. The electrical grid, emergency responses to protect people and infrastructure, combined with steady ecological restoration to rebuild natural safeguards, and careful, transparent experimentation with new technologies, supported by strong oversight and clear accountability. There is no easy path, only trade-offs we must acknowledge. So the questions remain for scientists, policymakers, military planners, Guam's residents, and environmental advocates alike. What should we prioritize? Extinguishing the immediate crisis or reshaping the system to prevent it from happening again? Who will bear responsibility when consequences exceed expectations? And is the lesson of Guam powerful enough to spark preventive policies on other islands before history repeats itself? What do you think? Do we choose swift intervention or do we choose patience to fix the system itself? And who will step forward to answer these questions?